and uh, hopefully that'll be that'll be good. I'm also gonna turn around so I'm facing the camera, not just sort of you know living. Um, okay, so. Hi, user 2985 with the same profile picture who has been banned about a million times yesterday and will be banned again about now because, you know, when you get banned 800 million times, you got to get the hint. You got to get the hint. And I don't know why you feel the need to... Um, I don't know why you feel the need to keep creating profiles and keep appearing here, but uh, you're not welcome. Anyways, uh, hi, Prexis. We just had a little trolly troll to deal with. Hi, Joe. Um, poor troll can't afford a new photo. Exactly. Well, so as I was saying a little earlier, I am <laughs> today I'm trying to wear white, red, and green, which are the colors of the um, flag of Wales because, well, the Prince of Wales has become king and uh, Wales has gotten a new Prince of Wales. And as I said earlier, I'm going to give my thoughts on that. And today we're going to be talking about Queen Elizabeth, whether you love her, whether you hate her, whether you uh, don't care for her, whether you are very, oh, hi, Glenn. <laughs> Hi, Glenn. Whether you are uh, very indifferent to her, whether you are um, Switzerland <laughs> on the topic of Queen Elizabeth, uh, quite a few people are mourning her death today, and I thought I would give you a brief history on who she was, what she has done, and... Um, and uh, what has happened during her reign. Now, she is the longest reigning monarch uh, in uh, the history of Great Britain and, um, and Northern Ireland. She had, in 2015, she had become the longest reigning monarch and um, uh, basically... Uh, before that, it was her uh, great-grandmother, Queen Victoria. And she has been in power for more than um, seven uh, for more than seventy years, because she uh, she ascended to the to the throne in uh, in nineteen fifties. So Queen Elizabeth has um, was alive from nineteen twenty six to two thousand twenty two which made her 95 years old, almost 96. And she became the queen of Great Britain, Northern Ireland in 1952. Now she became uh, the queen very suddenly because, um, because her father had died a sudden death. And also, if you didn't know these details, uh, neither Queen Elizabeth, nor her dad were ever supposed to be the reigning monarchs because they were not in the direct line of succession to the throne. It was um, Queen Elizabeth's father's brother who was actually the crown prince, Hraimslava, who was actually the crown prince and who was supposed to be king, but he abdicated the throne. <laughs> ambivalent here with the exception that Charles is lame -o. Well, we're going to talk about him, don't worry. But basically what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you a, uh, I'm going to give you a history on Queen Elizabeth. I did uh I did take notes and I did write out everything that I wanted to say because well, it's really hard to fit so much information sort of in like a good progression. So I'm going to be reading from my notes here and then I'm going to be expanding on it. Uh, and then after that, we can discuss a little about uh, about everything that has been said in terms of history. And then I'm going to give you some fun facts about uh, Queen Elizabeth or facts that you just might not have known. And then we're going to get into the topic of Charles and his history and what we can expect from him as king. And we're also going to get into interesting facts about Charles that you might not have known. So without further ado... Um, uh, she is basically the queen that is known for her efforts to modernize the institution of monarchy. And if you might not 
if you don't agree with that, I will give you some um, I will give you some reasons as to why. One of them is actually uh, Hi Nicole. One of them is actually the cover of Time magazine. And there is a huge story behind it. And I will tell you what the story is. And she has done quite a few little things like that that sort of gave her this title of the monarch who was trying to modernize the institution. And uh, she also really loved corgis. And throughout her lifetime, uh, high Switzerland, and throughout her lifetime, she has had over 30 corgis. She received her first corgi on her 18th birthday. And ever since, it was Queen Elizabeth and the corgis. <laughs> so um, let me see. Okay, so Princess Elizabeth was born to Prince Albert, Duke of York, who would take the regal name George VI on his, uh, on his accession. And Elizabeth Bowes, uh, and her mom was Elizabeth, Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, right? Or Elizabeth Bowes Lyon. Uh, she entered the world in a townhouse belonging to her grandparents at 17 Burton Street in Mayfair. She was called Elizabeth Alexandra Mary after her mother, great-grandmother, and grandmother. Um, the princess was destined for a, for a good marriage and a little more, which is something that was said about her at her birth. And if you think about it, she... Um, actually did have a very good marriage. Uh, if we think about it in terms of her passing even, she had succeeded her husband, Philip, by a year and they were not, and they were incredibly like happy together. And whether you like Queen Elizabeth or whether you don't, again, like the thing is uh, that their marriage was very happy. They did spend a lot of time together and it did seem, at least from the outside perspective and from all, all of the information that are available, uh, that is available about her, that they were an incredibly happy couple, right? Which is, uh, listen, they were together for decades, <laughs> so many decades. They were together since she became queen, and she was the queen for more than um, for more than seventy years. So that's also more. They were together for more than seventy years. So I will say that is a happy marriage if I've ever seen one. Uh, Elizabeth was born during the reign of her grandfather, George V. Her father, the Duke of York, was himself a second son, whose elder brother, Edward, Prince of Wales, was ahead of them both. It was reasonably expected that Edward would have children of his own who would then succeed him and become um, the reigning monarchs. So there is very little likelihood of Elizabeth ever coming to the, to the throne to begin with. But in 1936, that drastically changed when Edward, Edward, who was reigning uh, in the name of Edward VIII, was abdicated the, th the throne in favor of marrying uh, a divorcee, an American socialite, uh, Wallace Simpson. No, it's not Wikipedia. It is my notes. Thank you very much. And um, he basically uh, abdicated the throne because he wanted to marry a woman who was divorced a couple of times, who was a an American like socialite, and she was not considered someone suitable to be hi Jeremy to be the wife of the reigning king. So they would never crown her queen and uh, queen consort, and they would never crown her. Uh, they would never let it happen. So he had to choose between the throne and between uh, the woman that he loved, and he chose the woman that he loved. Um, and so when that happened, uh, he, um, when that happened, basically, uh, Queen Elizabeth's father, King George VI, became king, and she became the heir presumptive. And also, uh, if you say Wikipedia one more time, I'm gonna block you because you're annoying because you're annoying as hell. And as I said, it's my notes. And if you want to go check Wikipedia, you can do so. I wouldn't recommend that because there are history journals that have this information available, and that's where I take my notes from because I think that people who trust Wikipedia should not be trusted on anything but the super basics that don't give you a lot of details. And also, again, if you'd like to gain any knowledge about something, please go and read anything 
other than Wikipedia. God, I love live streams, you know, because I cannot have a single live stream without some sort of a lovely human being coming in here and annoying me to the core of my existence. Anyways, <laughs> uh, In 1934, at the wedding of Princess Marina of Greece and Denmark and Prince George, Duke of Kent, she met Prince Philip, who later became her husband. However, they have not started talking together and they have not started exchanging letters until five years later when they met again at the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. And so then they... Um, and so then they basically started talking to each other. At that point, it was um, it was exchanging letters. How cute, you know, because well, it was the time period, you know, 1930s. <laughs> On December 10th, 1936, 10-year-old Elizabeth was about to write her notes from her swimming lessons when she heard chants outside, God save the king. And so she asked one of the staffers and she was like, what is that about? And so she was informed that her uncle had abdicated the throne and that her father is now king and she as the eldest sister is now the heir presumptive um if you read the memoirs of Pavel Filat, considering he quits the russian army uh jeremy so okay so uh i will i will look at your tweet i haven't seen it yet but uh right now on this particular live we're going to be talking about queen elizabeth and um the British monarchy, and we're sort of going to be doing the history of that. So uh, no Ukraine-Russia related questions today, or not no Ukraine-Russia related questions <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. But so yeah, so she found out that her that she's going to be the heir apparent to the throne and her dad is now king when she was 10 years old, because she saw because she heard some chants, God save the king outside and had to ask one of the staffers what happened. And they had informed her that, well, now you are the crown princess and uh, your father is the sitting king. So a uh, high gentle artist. So that was a very interesting, a very interesting thing. Uh, so I'm going to go over like notable things. Um, uh, I'm going to go over notable things. Also, gosh, sir, that dude that keeps showing up and saying that, oh my gosh, guess who's back? It's like, he thinks that uh, he thinks that he is annoying me so much, and I'm just like I feel bad for him because it's about the eleventh account that this may oh ninth account that this man, man has made in in like nine nine days. And what I want to do is I want you to approach me on like email so I can suggest you a therapist, a psychotherapist, because you quite you need a help you need you need help from fixations because this is a fixation and these things can actually be medicated and they can they can be worked through with therapy loads in your case but still anyways <laughs> so it was on October 13th, 1940, on the BBC Children's Hour, during which the princess addressed children who had been evacuated from Britain to America, thus being uh, thus delivering her first radio broadcast. So uh, we are all, we are trying to do all we can to help our gallant sailors, soldiers, and airmen, and we are trying to, to bear our own share of the danger and sadness of war, she told them. We know every one of us that in the end, all will be well. So that was the first radio broadcast that she did, and it was 1940. Uh, during, so basically, Elizabeth also, uh, also insisted on joining the ATS, which is the Auxiliary Territorial Service, um, during World War II. And it was not something she had to do as the member of the royal family. It's something that she insisted on doing because she wanted to for her country. And she was basically the first royal family member that ended up serving in the military. Uh, rather, the first royal family member and a woman who ended up serving in the military uh, full time. So during her time with the ATS, ATS, she took a training course in diving and vehicle maintenance at the major garrison of Eldershot, qualifying just as the war ended. 
Elizabeth's attendance was somewhat circumscribed. She was driven home to Windsor Castle every night and was taken to the office uh, to the officer's mess for meals. But it was at least an opportunity to test herself against less privileged contemporaries for the first time in her life. More importantly, the pictures of her fiddling with an engine and the newsreel of her driving a truck showed her doing her bit. And so she learned how to dive when she was in the military and she also joined she also learned how to work on cars while she was in the military. And I think that was like a very very interesting thing um a very 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 interesting thing for a monarch to do, right? Because nobody before her had done that. Queen Elizabeth had one sister, Princess Margaret, who is uh, known to be quite the troublemaker of the family. And uh, on a lot of instances, Margaret has been in the British tabloids, which we know are ruthless. And she had been kind of, um, I think one of the things that Queen Elizabeth has done in her life is that she has significantly improved the image of the royal family when it was dwindling and she had also probably been the sole reason why people still loved the royal family because uh to be honest uh princess margaret has done her fair share of destroying that images that image and uh so did charles <laughs> so uh princess margaret has been uh nicknamed by the staff as her rude highness <laughs> She's also been uh, the classy younger sister. She's been divorced and she has had a series of very, very, very followed by the tabloids love affairs, especially after her divorce from her beloved husband, who, um, well, I shall say she was not too keen on divorcing him. She didn't necessarily want that to happen. However, he quite clearly did. So it was not something that she was super into. It was not something that she wanted very much, but he definitely did. And I think that that took a very big toll on her and her es escapades or escapades rather. Uh, let me fix this for one second. Why is this lamp hating me so much right now? Come on, lamp. I know you can do better. Uh, the one oh there we go okay so um that definitely uh influenced her escapades and influenced her media presence now queen elizabeth also has uh, four children charles and andrew and edward uh we have all heard a lot about prince andrew her eldest child charles was born in 1948 um then uh her uh, he was followed by a younger sister, Princess Anne, uh, in 1950. And, uh, and then it was Prince Andrew, Andrew, Duke of York in 1960, and then Prince Edward, Earl of Wessex in 1964. She also has eight grandchildren, Peter, Zara, William, Harry, Beatrice, Eugenie, Louise, and James. She has she has had six royal residences uh, where she spent most of her time, and it was Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle, Balmoral Castle, Sar Sardingham House, Holyrood Palace, and Hillsborough Castle. So those are um, the most notable residences. Uh, the most notable notable of all, I guess, is the Windsor Castle and the Balmoral Castle, where Queen Elizabeth passed away today. Well, at this point, I guess already tomorrow by English time or by uh, the UK time. And she passed away in Balmoral Castle, which is in Scotland. And it was said that she passed away peacefully. And it was also sad. Um, it was also sad, uh, said that she uh, passed away within the circle of her family and that the family was quite aware of what was going to happen and that it was going to, and that it was going to happen soon. Uh, also her, her wedding was, um, was the first televised wedding in, um, in, uh, basically British history and some about like, 
27 million people in the UK watched it. Uh, sorry, her, her buddy, her coronation. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> sorry, I blinked. So her coronation to become queen was uh, the first televised coronation and some 27 million people watched it around the world. She was on vacation with Prince Philip at Sagana Lodge in Kenya when news of King George VI's death in 1952 reached the couple. Prince Philip was also the person to break the news to her. So her dad uh, actually had, Sardingham, yeah, well, Sardingham Castle, where did I? Okay, so um, yes, she did die in her room peacefully. Her dad apparently as well died in his room peacefully. Gosh, Brooklyn, I love Brooklyn so much. Her dad apparently died in his room peacefully as well. So he had had an operation and he had had issues with his lungs. He was also a smoker, a very avid smoker. And after the operation, his health was apparently getting better or seemingly better to everybody else. On the day that he passed away, he went hunting and then he had dinner with his wife, uh, the queen. And then he retired to his room and that's where he died. Uh, so there were 8,251 guests invited to Elizabeth II's coronation at Westminster Abbey on June 2nd, 1953. So as I said, an additional 27 million people in the UK watched the almost three-hour ceremony on television with only the anointing and communion not broadcast to the wider world. And she is the sixth queen can't talk what way about the queen. And she was the sixth queen to have been crowned in Westminster Abbey in her own right. The first queen was Mary, daughter of Henry VIII, and his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. She was crowned on October uh, 1st, 1553. So that's an interesting, uh, so that's an interesting um, fact. <laughs> Hi, lucky skill. <laughs> Well, um, there is on Twitch, there is Nightbot, which is this bot that kind of uh, looks out for people. And um, people, the load bot kind of like goes crazy. So it just went a little crazy. So a couple of interesting things about Queen Elizabeth. Uh, she has lived through 15 British prime ministers. And the prime ministers typically had weekly meetings with the Queen in Buckingham Palace, a tradition that started with Winston Churchill, who is kind of crowned, not crowned, but like who's kind of referred to as her second father because she lost her father very young, right? And, uh, and uh, her uh, Winston Churchill basically was that father figure for her, as is rumored. And he was one of the people who... Um, who was like one of her biggest confidants, who also helped her through with like adjusting to the role of the queen and stuff like that. So Winston Churchill was um, a very big figure in her life. And so here is the list of prime ministers that she has gone through. First is Winston Churchill, then Anthony Eden, then Harold Miller, then Alan Douglas Holm, then Harold Wilson, then Edward Heath, then James Callahan, then Margaret Thatcher, then John Major, then Tony Blair, then Gordon Brown, then David Cameron, then Theresa May, then Boris Johnson, and then Liz Truss for one day, pretty much. I did watch the show The Crown, and I've talked about it a little earlier, and while historic sequences of events are really uh, real there, a lot of the dialogue and a lot of the things that actually happen are quite exaggerated for the Hollywood effect. So she had also lived through 14 U.S. presidents, and uh, she met 13 of them except for one, and that one was Lyndon B. Johnson. Uh, she has been uh, to the U.S. five times to meet with the uh, presidents. She has lived through seven popes, and she has two official uh, two official birthdays, one in April and one in June. So her real birthday is April 21st, 
but since the weather is usually um since the weather is usually pretty awful during that time still thatcher the lady had hairs on her teeth yeah thatcher was not great uh so basically uh thatcher's voice was just awful genuinely uh but um but basically oh my gosh this is so distracting like the trolls really don't i don't really care for them but they just distract me with how like uh, limited they are anyways so uh her actual birthday is on april 21st but they would also celebrate it uh in june because the weather in june is much nicer and so it's much easier to kind of um to kind of have a celebration around it when the weather is uh much better uh she's done 69 christmas broadcasts and uh <laughs> Uh, and, um, she allegedly had a 10 minute, uh, audience with an intruder. So there was that, um, bit in the crown actually, that was actually quite real. Give me one second. Listen, love man, I don't like you. I don't like you at all. And I think you think that you creating more and more accounts somehow bothers me. But I, as I said, while you were blocked, it's, um, but you were blocked so you couldn't hear it. I think that you need help. I think that you really need help. And I think that you need to get yourself a job. That's the point. Because the fact that this is your 10th or 11th account that you have created after you have been booted indicates that you really have nothing to do and way too many emails to keep doing that. So I would say if you need, um, if you need help, please reach out to a psychotherapist because, uh, this is an obsession and this is a fixation. And those things can quite literally be worked through with loads of therapy in your case, but they can still be worked through. And if you think that you somehow bother me or you somehow, I don't know, add or take away from my day, that is a mistake. You don't. And after this, I literally always going to ignore you and you can write as much as you want. I'm never going to respond to you, but that is just sad on your behalf because you could be doing so much more with your life than harassing a random woman on the internet. I understand that you probably can't harass women in real life because nobody gets to talk to you or nobody wants to, but neither do I. And just because I'm on the internet does not make me an object. And just because you can hide behind the anonymity and that horrendous profile picture also doesn't change anything. So excuse yourself until I, before I excuse you. Anyways, uh, my gosh. But so on July 9th, 1982, painter and decorator Michael Fagan broke into Buckingham Palace and made his way to the queen's bedroom in what was one of the biggest royal security breaches of the 20th century. Initial reports that the queen stole Fagan in 10 minutes of conversation while waiting for security have been debunked by none other than Fagan himself. Now, she went past me and ran out of the room, her little bare feet running across the floor. Her nightie was one, who was one of those liberty prints, and it was down to her knees, said Fagan in a 2012 interview with The Independent. So when you were watching the, um, when you were watching uh, The Crown, which I'm assuming a lot of you did, there was, um, there was this moment where it was said that the queen met with the intruder and he was in her bedroom and they were talking. She was telling him, no, he literally broke in. She saw him. <laughs> she freaked out. And then the security got him. So that was about it. It wasn't nearly as dramatized as it was in the crown. Then year 1992 was the honest horribilis <laughs> for the queen. Uh, it was a disaster of a fire broke out in Windsor Castle and the respective marriages of three of her children, Prince Charles, Prince Andrew, and Princess Anne, broke down. The Queen deemed deemed this her Annis which was a horror year. Uh, she celebrated six jubilees. She's worn 5,000 plus hats. And um, she was the head of 54 members of the Commonwealth nations, and she was the ceremonial head of them. 
Hi, uh, hi, Sky. Uh, so one of the things is that uh, is is that you don't know probably about her is that she had never had for a passport. She does not need to have a driver's license or a passport because she is just the queen. And uh, uh, she, uh, <laughs> the one of the reasons why she can't have a passport is because the passports are issued in the name of Her Majesty, which would mean that she would have to issue a passport to herself And all of the members, all of the other members of the royal family require a and have one. Uh, she has never had to apply for a driving, driving license, uh, she, a driver's license. She does not need one. And I believe that she learned how to drive in her 40s or even her 50s, maybe. She's visited 116 countries. Uh, there are only two nations to which she has never been to in the Commonwealth, and those are the Rwanda and, and Cameroon. And she has had 265 official overseas visits carried out by her. <sighs> so there was a dog breed that was invented by the queen and it was the dorgie. It was a hybrid that emerged when one of Elizabeth's corgis made it with a dash hound named Pipkin belonging to Princess Margaret. So uh, a dorgie, a dash hound corgi, and that was a result of a um, pure coincidence. 100 plus uh, racing horses were owned by her No, not Dorky Popkin. Pipkin is the name of the dog. She, um, the Queen's estimated lifetime winnings from horse racing in prize money was 6.75 million British pounds. And uh, she owns all of the swans and birds in lakes uh, of uh, ducks and swans and stuff like that in lakes of the UK. So those are some of the facts about her that are short. And this is some of the history of, sh of how she came to the throne. Uh, it is said that her and Prince Philip's relationship was uh, one of the only very real relationships between the monarchs, right? That they were actually a couple who were very close, who relied on each other very, very, very much. And uh, also uh, he was her cousin. <laughs> Prince Philip was her third cousin, and uh, uh, if you didn't know this, all of the royal families and all of the royal um, kind of like people with royal ancestry are somewhat related from different uh, for, for like generations or something like that. They're very far removed normally, but yeah, they're third cousins. Um, also, the name Windsor is something that they have take uh, they have taken up during. Um, during the dislike of Germans in World War I, and they just took the name of the castle where they lived, but they were actually German. Third cousin, sixth cousin, and eighth cousin, yeah. So yeah, they are, uh, they were a couple's goal, uh, except for that little, little detail that he's her third cousin. That's, that's just about it. Um, but yes, they were, according to everybody that, um, according to everybody that was close to them, they were incredibly close. They did rely on each other a lot. He was an amazing husband to her and they were very supportive of each other and each other's hobbies. And they, well, if you could see, if you could see really all of the times that they've appeared in public together, they seemed very, very close and even when they were incredibly old, right, they still seemed very close and it still looked like they were very much in love. Now, Queen Elizabeth was kind of like the glue to the monarchy because she was the person who was, you know, she came to the throne 
uh, unexpectedly when her father died unexpectedly. And I think that it looks like she has made it her duty to be queen first and foremost. And anytime there was something negative going on about the monarchy, she would fix it. Like Scotland wanted to want it out of the UK and they stayed because, well, they were also promised a lot, but also because a lot of them were fond of Queen Elizabeth. Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth also had a, a nickname, Lilybeth, and so a lot of people also called her Queen Lilybeth. That's what her dad called her, as far as I know, and that's what her family members called her. Well, the family members before she was queen and family members that are incredibly close to her, like her sister, her mother. <laughs> Um, yeah, and she very much loved hunting. She very much loved nature. So she was very often found in Scotland at Balmoral. Hi, New Zealand. And um, that's, that's that about her. And now I'm actually going to open a couple of articles that I prepared on my iPad that will tell you um, a couple of very interesting things about her because I found, um, I have found some very, very cool facts. So, as I said earlier, in 1944, for her 18th birthday, she was given her first corgi, and she owned more than 30 corgis and dorgies, dash hound corgis, during her reign, most of them descendants of Susan. Susan was her uh, first corgi. Uh, Elizabeth joined the women's branch of the British Army, the, Auxil the Auxiliary Territorial Service, as I said earlier, during World War II, becoming the first female member of the royal family to serve as a full-time active member of the military. During her service, she learned to drive and maintain vehicles. Oh, okay. So uh, it was during her, it was during World War II that she learned how to drive. I guess she uh, started like driving a car full time in her 40s or something because before that she was driven around. Uh, I remember reading something like that, but I just didn't want to lie to you guys. So Princess Elizabeth sent her first electronic message on March 26, 1976. The message, which would later become known as email, was sent to the U.S. Secretary of Defense to formally open collaboration between the two countries on a military computer programming language. She was the first British royal and among the first people outside top secret military circles to ever use the technology. So Windsor Castle, which was Elizabeth's primary residence until her passing, is the largest and oldest palace in the world still in use by the royal family. William the Conqueror ordered construction to begin in 1070, and his castle was ready 16 years later. It has been a home to Britain's kings and queens ever since. Elizabeth's formal coronation ceremony in 1953, about four months after she actually took the throne upon the death of her father, King George VI, was the first to be broadcast on live television. Some 27 million people watched it in the United States kingdom alone. Um, we have more facts. This one is something that I actually, uh, that I was reading upon recently and I, um, and recently being today, <laughs> because it was, uh, if you guys know, there is this cover of the Time magazine with Queen Elizabeth. And there are a couple of very interesting facts about that cover that I want to share with you. First of all, uh, Sir Cecil Beaton, a British fashion portrait and war photographer, took the photograph that appears in a commemorative issue of the time. Beaton, who died in 1980, had a long history of photographing the royals and his images of them simultaneously grandiose and intimate helped to mold the image of the monarchy in the mid-1900s. He was first invited by Queen Elizabeth I to photograph the royal family around 1939, when he wrote in his diary, In choosing me to take her photographs, the Queen made a daring innovation. It is inconceivable that her predecessor would have summoned me. My work was still considered revolutionary and unconventional. 
Beaton also cultivated a long-lasting relationship with Queen Elizabeth II, still a princess, when he first met the family and would go on to photograph monumental events, including her coronation in 1953 and the births of all her four children. Now, the reason why this cover is so uh, inc is so like symbolic is because this is the last picture that he had taken of her. She is 42 in that photo. She's 42 in that photo, and that photo was taken in the summer of 1968. And uh, that image is often regarded as timeless. So the reason why they used it on the commemorative issue of the time this time is because it's a timeless image, and it's also the last image that he had ever taken of her. And um, it's kind of like, you know, an interesting play on the situation because it is the last image that he had taken of her. And it also is timeless. And this issue is to commemorate her very, very long and eventful life. Then this issue uh, of the 90, it's This is a 1952 issue. Uh, of the Time magazine, and she's on the cover, and it's, again, his photograph. I will show it to you. And it's bordered by a silver ribbon, a rare occurrence for Time magazine, which, ra which rarely deviates from its iconic red borders. The last time the magazine used a silver border for a cover that featured an individual was in 2008, when Barack Obama was named President of the United States. Um... And so she has, uh, she, um, sorry, let me show you this. This is the cover, and this is on Time Magazine's website itself. So this is, is the iconic cover with the silver ribbons, which, again, was only given to very few individuals. Uh and this cover is, uh, yeah, it's very iconic. Queen Elizabeth II had a storied history of appearing in Time's covers. She first graced the front of the magazine in 1929 as Princess Lily Bet. She has since been on the cover at least 10 times before now, including in January 1952 as Time's Person of the Year. Most recent, uh, in January 1953, as Time's Person of the Year of 1952. Most recently, the Queen was featured on the June 4th, 2012 cover of Time's Europe edition to mark her Diamond Jubilee. And this is the last time that she has appeared on the cover of Time before now. Thank you, Maxim. Now, some more interesting things that you did not know about Queen Elizabeth. And some of them, honestly, I found very, very strange. But let me, let me see. Oh, I don't know why. Oh, it's just like that. So, yeah, her nicknames include Lilybet and Cabbage. She got the nickname Lilybet when she was young and couldn't pronounce her name, so she called herself Lilybet. King George VI used to talk about his daughter, saying, Lilybet is my pride and Margaret is my joy. It has also been reported that Prince Philip lovingly re referred to her as Cabbage. She studied cons constitutional history and law. That was uh, what she studied in college. She served in World War II, which we already talked about. She met Prince Philip when she was eight years old, but they did not start talking until about five years later. Um, she had eight bridesmaids at her um, at her wedding, and it, it was Princess Margaret, Princess Alexandra of Kent, Lady Caroline Montagu Douglas Scott, Lady Mary Cambridge, Pamela Mountbatten, Margaret Elphistone, and Diana Bowes lion. She learned how to drive in 1945. That's what it was. She learned how to drive in 1945 during her time in the army. She has made five official visits to the United States during her reign. 
she has owned the corgis as we as we have talked about multiple times i feel like anytime i read anything about about queen elizabeth and it's been since before today anytime i have ever read anything about her it's literally if the corgis aren't mentioned i don't even know what happened the corgis seem to be the central plot of her life prince george called her gan gan Kate Middleton says that her eldest son, Prince George, calls his great-grandmother Gan Gan. <laughs> Apparently, the designate it's the designation the generations of royals have used to describe their great-grandmothers. I guess like grand-grand, so Gan Gan. <laughs> she speaks fluent French or spoke fluent French. Norman Hartnell designed her wedding and coronation gowns. British designer Norman Hartnell designed some of the Queen's most iconic dresses, including her coronation dress and wedding gown. Hartnell was officially appointed dressmaker to the royal family in 1938. He's acknowledged for creating a stylistic royal image that remains today. Hartnell also designed Princess Margaret's wedding dress and much of the Queen Mother's wardrobe. She doesn't need a driver's license, a license plate, or a passport. So yes, we were talking about the fact that she does not need a passport because it, it all of the passports are issued in the queen's name. And that would mean that she needs to issue herself a passport. She does not need a driver's license, but she also doesn't need a license plate. She received around 70,000 letters a year. She celebrates two birthdays, as we said already. Her crown snapped on her wedding day. The tiara that Queen Elizabeth wore on her wedding day was made in 1919 for her grandmother, Queen Mary. On the day of her wedding, as a hairdresser was securing the veil with the tiara, the antique metal frame snapped. The Queen Mother reportedly told her daughter, we have two hours and there are other tiaras. She paid for her... One second. Yeah, so my camera glitched. Uh, she paid for her wedding dress in coupons from war. The queen used her rationing coupons and received a gift of 200 coupons from the British government in order to buy the material needed to create her beautiful wedding dress. The iconic dress featured a 13-foot-long train and over 10 thousand seed pearls imported from the U.S. Prince Philip is her third cousin, <laughs> and they're related through Queen Victoria. Elizabeth and Philip are, are third cousins through Queen Victoria of Britain, as she was both of their great-grandmother. Prince Philip is related to Victoria through his maternal side, and Queen Elizabeth through her paternal side. So yeah, they share a great-grand, you know? That's a little, that's a little strange. Uh, she wore the same nail polish for most of the, um, uh, since 1989 and, uh, it's Essie Ballet Slippers Shade. So that's the nail polish, polish that she's always worn. She owns, an, she owned, it's hard to talk about her in the past tense because it had just happened, right? So she owned an apartment in New York City. It has been reported that Her Majesty purchased an $8 million, 3,000 square foot modern penthouse in United Nations Plaza in New York City in 2015. The building is designed by architect Norman Foster, who was knighted by the Queen herself in 1990. She has 30 grandchildren. Sorry, godchildren. I was like, wait, she's 30 godchildren. She has a she had a glass of champagne each night before going to bed. Well, maybe that is the maybe that is the, you know, maybe that is how she lived so long. Also, if you have noticed, you've never seen Queen Elizabeth without her handbag in public. It is rumored that her handbag use serves as a gesture as a gesture for her staffers to sort of like um if something's happening to give them a signal. So her signals are communicated through her handbag. Uh, she received exotic animals as a gift. 
The queen received many gifts, and some of the craziest include the animals she gets. She has received everything, including horses, cows, elephants, kangaroos, swans, crocodiles, sloths, and jaguars. She often donated the animals to the London Zoo. Well, I mean, uh, no wonder, because what is she going to do with them? Uh, she, ho she hosted Buckingham Palace's first ever women-only event, which I find very cool because that is progressive, see? And she did try to sort of, she did try to push the boundaries of the monarchy. She just didn't necessarily do it at a fast enough pace. She has a personal poet who writes poetry for her. She has set for over 129 portraits during her reign, which I find very interesting. She made a cameo with James Bond. For the 2012 Olympics, the queen and her corgis made a cameo in a James Bond sequence. She joined actor Daniel Craig on board a helicopter for a hilarious six minute action sequence. Uh, so as I said, she is the longest reigning monarch in British history, and she bypassed Queen Victoria in 2015. And she used to wake up to a bagpiper every morning as her alarm clock, which is something that I find incredibly interesting about her too, because I don't know if I would want to wake up to a bagpiper every morning. That I mean, bagpipers are, it's, it's, it's incredible, but also that is a lot Every, for every morning, that is a lot. I can't even begin to tell you <laughs> how a lot that is. Uh, but here, uh, she now, since she had passed, uh, the Britain now has a new king. And the name of that king is King Charles III who was born on November 14th, 1948 at Buckingham Palace while, there, while his father was playing a game of squash. Now, Charles was a crown prince and a prince of, and a prince of Wales. Obviously, he was the eldest of four children. And um, he, during his like life, he was a very shy, sort of very introverted, very anxious appearing man and um he didn't necessarily uh he wasn't very well liked by the public because he was kind of shy and he was kind of not extroverted and he was more closed into himself it is being said that he didn't necessarily like the rules of the monarchy he liked the idea of being king right or ego purposes, but he didn't necessarily want to abide by the rules of the monarchy. So uh, early on in his existence, a lot has been said about like him not having it, you know? So um, so in February 6th, 1952, he became the heir uh, to the throne because his mother became queen. He, uh, in October 1957, Charles began, began Hill House Prep School in Knightsbridge, the first royal ever, uh, royal ever to attend school. Then he went on to Cheam, his father's prep school, uh, to attend that school. In July 1958, Elizabeth uh, named him uh, officially the Prince of Wales, and he was nine years old at that time. And the Prince of Wales is the title given to the male heirs to the throne. So he was only nine when he became an heir to the throne and officially became, you know, uh, the Prince of Wales. At age 13 in 1962, he moved to his father's old school, Gordonstown, in Aberdeenshire, later describing it as a prison sentence and called it in kilts. He left with six O-levels and two A-levels, history B and French C. In October 1967, he became the first heir to attend university, moving to Trinity College in Cambridge. 
He graduated in 1970 with a 2-2 two, a two, two in anthropology, archaeology, and history. Uh, in 1969, he was crowned Prince of uh, Wales at a ceremony in Carnifron Castle. And so this is where I'm going to open a little bit of a cheat sheet because I want to give you his real speech compared um, uh, the Welsh absolutely despised that. I'm going to give you his real speech compared to the speech that a lot of you might have heard in the crown. So here is the gist of what happened. Charles had been taken out of his uh, time in Cambridge, and he was uh, basically sent to Wales because he, as the Prince of Wales, needed to understand what it's like to be Welsh because the anti-English sentiment in Wales was like prospering at the time and the Queen had to do something. And you know the fact that he was the Prince of Wales and he was basically getting his like coronation it was uh, incredibly important that he pay, uh, pays like owed to the people of Wales. And so he came to Wales and he had to do one-on-one -on -one, uh, classes with a tutor to study Welsh and to live for nine weeks in Wales and kind of understand what it's like to be Welsh, which... Um, which I'm not sure how he was supposed to understand them because he was not Welsh and was never going to be Welsh. And this was like a vacation for nine uh, for nine weeks. Yeah. And, um, investiture. Yes, that's exactly what it was. And so he was 20 years old and he was um, studying at Aberystwyth College and it was 1969. So he was also saying that it was According to his interviews, you know, he was already anxious and normally you would think that the world hates you and that would be a result of your anxiety, except for him that was reality because every day that he was going to his class in Welsh, he was seeing people that were having some sort of a protest that was aimed at anti-him. So the people there in Wales quite literally despised him. They despised everything about him and... Um, and uh, they were not happy to see him there. So uh, then the Labour Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, suggested that he should, you know, the reason why he, he ended up there is because, again, the, the anti-English sentiment was really high. And the suggestion was to send him to Wales because that could serve, uh, you know, because his uh, investiture, investiture was supposed to be a very good opportunity to show Wales respect, you know. Uh, so his speech was supposed to become that symbol of respect. Ah. So he came to Wales and in Wales, he was assigned a teacher. That teacher that he was assigned in Wales was uh, Millward, who was at that time very well known as... Um, a Welsh nationalist who dedicated his life to preserving the Welsh language, to educating people in the Welsh language. And um, he, in his own words, was incredibly surprised when the university asked him to teach Charles because while he was a Welsh nationalist, he didn't want anything to have to do with the royal family, England or the English. He was a Welsh nationalist. And so uh, while he, he was actually like a, um, a, a very apparent choice because his life goal was to keep Welsh alive, right? Uh, but so in The Crown, this whole situation is played so as to they had this like weird relationship in a good way where, you know, Prince Charles came and Millward hated him. And then they formed this kind of friendship and Millward was so, so, so proud of him. And Charles was like so much different than everybody else. There is um, there is a lot to it that was true. But um, but. It was also not nearly as dramatic. I'm going to read you. So ba so after that, basically, Charles um, had said a speech 
that was supposed to recognize Wales as uh, a separate country with separate traditions. And it was a daring speech because it, uh, everybody was in the institution was afraid that it would fire and fuel uh, Welsh nationalism. Uh, so here's the thing. Yeah, it was daring for him for the time, but also he didn't necessarily... Um, it wasn't... Okay, so I'm going to read you the speech from the Crown, and then I'm going to read you the real speech that he delivered. It's not nearly as like straightforward and as pro-Welsh as the Crown had, had made it seem. It's not nearly as daring as the Crown has made it seem. It's not nearly as innovative or not nearly as like, wow... So, okay, um, here is, let me, let me try something for a second. I don't know why, but I'm seeing that my TikTok is having issues and I am going to say that those definitely, that it definitely looks like it's glitching and it is not that it's glitching and it is not playing which i find very strange because it shouldn't be so so let me see what's going on there because i don't think anybody can hear me i think that my connection quite literally was lost which is weird because it's been going on like that all day today so okay so um you guys couldn't hear me at all, right? On TikTok. Okay, so I'm going to read you the real speech, uh, the speech from the Crown, and then I'm going to read you the speech that actually happened. Hi, Jenny. So the speech from the Crown is as follows. Wales has a history to be proud of, and it is completely understandable that the Welsh wish to hold on to their heritage, their native culture, their identity, their disposition, and their personality as a nation. It is important we respect that. Wales has her own identity, her own voice. And so this is what the Crown said. He said, this is what he actually said in the Welsh portion of that speech. The words of your address have certainly touched me deeply, and I can assure you I have taken note of the hopes expressed in them. It is indeed my firm intention to associate myself in word and deed with as much of the life of the principality as possible, and what a principality. It is with a certain sense of pride and emotion that I have received these symbols of office here in this magnificent fortress where no one could fail to be stirred by its atmosphere of time by its atmosphere of time worn grandeur. Now, where I myself could be unaware of the long history of Wales and its determination to remain individual and to guard its own particular heritage, a heritage that dates back into the mists of ancient British history, that has produced many brave men, princes, poets, bards, schol scholars, and more recently, great singers, a very memorable goon, and eminent film stars. All of these people have been inspired in some way by this heritage. And so this is the speech that he gave. And in this speech, he had basically, and in his time in Wales, he had basically promised that he would not be the same as everybody else and that he would, in fact, um, and that he would, in fact, pay more attention to Wales and that he would... Uh, and that he would actually give them sort of what they want, the respect they want, and uh, recognize their history. Now, this was the last time that he has ever done something for Wales. And he really did not, uh, did not, uh, you know, he said that he doesn't want it to be just a title. And that he doesn't want it to be uh, just like sort of, you know... Oh, yeah, like, I like Wales, and, uh, you know, I did this speech, and nothing ever came out of it, but, um, but that's what happened. He's never done anything for Wales since, and that was just empty words, and he was just another Prince of Wales who did not necessarily care for Wales, and appeared to have learned the language a little bit, and then uh, never came back and never did anything. <sighs> In 1971, he met and began dating Camilla Shand. They reportedly broke it off when she married Andrew Parker Bowles in 1973. 
In March 1971, he began his six months training as a jet pilot in the RAF then enrolls at Dartmouth Naval College before serving in a number of Royal Navy ships and training as a helicopter pilot. In 1976, Charles leaves the Navy using his military pension of 7,000 pounds to found the Prince's Trust, the first of more than 25 charities. In 1979, meets Diana Spencer, described by friends as sort of a wonderful English schoolgirl. August 1979, Lord Mountbatten, Charles' beloved great uncle and confidant, was killed by an IRA bomb. Yeah, he was very, very incredibly close with his uh, uncle Mountbatten. And that death apparently was a very, 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 uh, took like a very large toll on him. Uh, in February 1981, he was engaged to Diana and it was announced he was 31 and she was 19. And it, when asked if they were in love, he replies, whatever in love means. So in on July 29th, 1981, they were married at St. Paul, at St. Paul C C C Cathedral. Uh, on June 21st, 1982, uh, the Prince William of Wales was born, followed on September 15th, 1984 by Prince Henry of Wales. The royal marriage is already in acute difficulty. In 1986, he was reunited with Camilla Parker Bowles, with whom he had cut off contact. Later says his marriage had broken down ir uh, irretrievably by this point. Diana also takes lovers. In 1992, a publication of Diana, Her True Story by Andrew Morton reveals explosive details of the marriage failure. Yeah, red flag exactly, of the marriage failure. Um, then the son obtains an illicit recording of a phone conversation between Charles and Camilla in which she expresses a desire to be her tampon. Yeah, that one was very, 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 very strange. Like, no matter how many times I hear this, okay, like, you can like Prince Charles. You can be, you can have, like, a good idea of him, okay? But, like, this is a real thing that he said. And he had expressed desire to, I quote, be her tampon. I don't know whether you find it to, to be cute i don't know whether you find it to be like a, um a uh unique love confession but it is the creepiest thing that i have ever heard in my entire life uh so in december 1993 a year after the tampon scandal uh the separation of prince and princes of wales was announced i wonder why uh, in 1994 publication of the prince of wales for which author jonathan dimbleby is given full access to prince and his papers and diaries reveals details of his infidelity and suggestions that diana was mentally unstable November 20th, 1995, Diana gives interview to Panorama describing her crowded marriage, a program watched by 23 million people. August 28th, 1996, Charles and Diana's divorce was finalized. On August 31st, 1997, Diana was killed in a car crash in Paris, provoking widespread national distress and vilification of Charles. In 1999, two years after, Charles and Camilla make their first public appearance together at a party at the Ritz. So he did become her tampon goody. Uh, April 9th, 2005, wedding of Charles and Camilla at a register office in Windsor. Uh, or in Windsor, and uh, we are very grateful for her. She's made our father very happy, says Prince Harry later. Uh, July 22nd, 2013, birth of Prince George makes Charles a grandfather aged 64. So uh, this is a brief history of the things that happened with Charles. I personally, um, I think that there is a lot there that kind of makes him unsuitable for the post of king. And I will say that 
someone who goes to Wales, who spends so much time there and who promises to be different and then turns around and does exactly the same thing as he did, as everybody else did, not great. Uh, the fact that he was jealous, very clearly jealous of Diana's, of Diana's spotlight, not great because she was supposed to be his counterpart and she was supposed to add to his spotlight. Even if she took over his spotlight, that doesn't matter. I understand that he got the crappiest end of the stick in the royal family because he is also the longest heir apparent in British history, as in like he had to wait the longest to ascend to the throne. And I understand that he was very annoyed at that. I understand that he was very annoyed that, you know, he might never become king. He was very annoyed at the fact that his wife was much more liked than he was. But then at that point, you know, do something like make yourself more liked. Stop cheating on your 19 year old wife with like some random lady and maybe uh, and maybe appear more pleasant in the public eye rather than, you know, narcissistic and upset all the time. So I think that that was his issue. And I think that any man who is uh, scared and who is um, who is scared and who is threatened by their wife's spotlight is. Um, well, need I say anything else? Exactly. And here I want to tell you 10 surprising facts about King Charles III. So fact number one is King Charles III was the first royal baby born at the Buckingham Palace in the 20th century. King Charles III was just nine years old when he was officially given the title of the Prince of Wales. Uh, people weren't sure if King Charles III would keep his name. Many monarchs choose a regal name, as popes do, that is different than their birth name, such as Charles's grandfather's George VI, who had been christened Albert Frederick Arthur George and went by Bertie for most of his life. And though the king has been the most famous Charles in the UK for the seven decades, the previous two King Charleses did not go down well in British history. Charles I was executed for treason and the monarchy was briefly abolished because of his actions. His son, Charles II, spent time in exile until the monarchy was restored 11 years later, briefly. He was generally beloved, but was known as a philanderer who acknowledged at least a dozen illegitimate children. And to some, Charles Stuart, best known as Bonnie Prince Charles, and for the Jacobite rebellion in Scotland that attempted to put him on the throne, was called Charles III. However, according to, B to the BBC, Charles chose to keep his name. It was, once, uh, it was one of the earliest decisions he made after becoming king. Well, he became king, like, today. King Charles III can play cello. King Charles III's Secret Service nickname is Unicorn. Certain visiting dignitaries to the U.S. are given code names of their own, and Charles was given Unicorn. The fanciful name is oddly fitting. The Unicorn is the national animal of Scotland and has been part of its coat of arms for some 600 years. But the first recorded example of a Scottish monarch using a unicorn symbol strength was from the late 1300s when either Robert II or III used unicorns as part of the arms and gateway of Rothsey Castle on the Isle of Bute, Scotland. Among King Charles III's earliest titles, which he received at age five, is Duke of Rothsey. Yeah. Also, the Queen's title was London Bridge code name and so her passing is known as London Bridge has fallen down. Richard Nixon tried to set King Charles III up with his daughter Trisha. Well Trisha you dodged a bullet. In 1971 President Nixon's eldest daughter Trisha had the first outdoor White House wedding in the Rose Garden but the summer before her father was trying to plot play matchmaker with the future King of England. Charles and his sister, Princess Anne, were 21 and 19 at the time when they took an unofficial trip to Washington, D.C. 
They were feted as royal dignitaries, taken to various museums and D.C. area sites, and given rooms in the White House. Charles slept in the Lincoln bedroom. And according to Sally Bedell Smith's 2017 biography, Prince Charles, The Passions and Paradoxes of an Implorable Life, the president arranged to have Trisha seated next to Charles at every occasion, which annoyed him. Uh, even though he didn't hit it off with the first daughter, Bedell Smith says he would describe her ungenerously as artificial and plastic. Charles was still amused by the president's endeavors. Many years later, on a visit to Washington with Camilla, he was still laughing about Nixon's attempt at matchmaking. King Charles III first met Lady Diana Spencer when he was dating her older sister. Charles had a playboy reputation in his 20s, and any girl with a family pedigree was considered a potential princess, and therefore media fodder. In June 1977, he met Lady Sarah Spencer at a party at, Win uh, at Windsor Castle, and the two invited each other to polo and shooting events. That November, Charles went to the Spencer estate, Althorpe, where he met Sarah's younger sister. Diana was 16. According to Bedell Smith in her 1999 biography, Diana in Search of Herself, Portrait of a Troubled Princess, after going on a Swiss ski vacation with Charles in February 1978, Sarah told a tabloid that she was not falling for the then prince, saying, there is no question of me being the future Queen of England. I don't think he's met her yet. Uh, King Charles III wrote a children's book. In 1980, King Charles III wrote a children's book called The Old Men of Lochnagar, based on stories he would tell his younger brothers, Princess, An Prince, uh, Princess Andrew and Edward. It centers around an old man who went to the caves near, Bur near Balmoral looking for a quiet place to take a hot bath. The book was later turned into an animated short film nar narrated by the king. King Charles III won't be coronated right away. Charles became king as soon as his mother died, but though Charles's coronation, known as Operation Golden Orb, was planned before Elizabeth's demise, it won't happen immediately. The UK will first enter a period of mourning before beginning to prepare for the extravagant yet solemn re religious ceremony. Elizabeth II's coronation did not occur until over a year after she became queen. And that is all I have for now. Questions? <laughs> yes, Queen Elizabeth unfortunately passed away today. But yeah, that is basically the short story, a very, very, very short story fit into an hour of Queen Elizabeth and of um, King Charles. I wonder if he's going to live till his coronation because he does not look like he's in very good health. But, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, to me personally, he does look a little, a little, a little faint. But uh, he has been regarded as very problematic. He has been regarded as having very little popularity, and he has been uh, regarded as, um, especially after his marriage to Camilla, he has been um, he has been not very very well liked. Elizabeth died at I believe it was like one p.m. U.S. time. Oh, or like. Eastern Central Time. So, yeah, it was about 1.30 p.m. or like 1.20 p.m. Eastern Eastern Central. Yeah, so, see? Yeah, like 1 p.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, so 6 p.m. UK time, yeah. Um, actually, I don't know if Harry made it there in time because I was reading about him 
being on the way there um, very shortly before she died. But he was in the UK, and um, so is Megan, but they weren't at Balmoral directly. He was one hour late. Yeah, there we go. He was one hour late. Hi, Luann. But yeah, that's all I have about the queen for now. I didn't want to do it uh, too like history packed. I didn't want to do it very datey, although it did come out very datey because I did want to give you like the main events. I, um, if you guys are interested in more, um, <laughs> I don't want to be the queen, but thank you. <laughs> uh, but uh, basically, if you guys have any, like, if you want any specific topics that you want me to cover more about the monarchy, about um, Charles, about Camilla, but like, I mean, historical things, not gossip, <laughs> then please, uh, then please, um, then please submit it into my Q&A on my profile. And, uh, and why wait nine days to bring her back? Who? Tampons. Well, okay, that was not uh, gossip. That was quite literally something that um, that was very well known. <laughs> and it was proven, so to speak. He even tried to like... When this news came out, Charles even tried to, like, go over it and try to save himself somehow. And it was just disastrous. Because how can you, how can you save yourself? How can you explain saying, um, how can you explain saying, saying that, that you... I'm sorry, that you want to pee your lover's tampon and try to say that, you know, the world just did not get, um, did not get that right. You did such a good job on Ukraine's history. Well, that's uh, very kind of you to say, but I was not doing Ukraine history today. It was UK history. Uh, oh my gosh, I learned to the royal gossip. <laughs> Yeah, Luann, the new king, the beloved King Charles. And read his script. It's like, well, I meant I'm going to, uh, uh, really, uh, it was it was just not good phones, you know. Uh, all I was trying to say is that I would love to go fetch you some tampons. And they, you know, the media, the media... They made it sound like I said I wanted to be her tampon. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> that's not what he said, but I'm just like, you know, I feel like that would be more believable. It'd be more believable if he just came out and said, <laughs> and said like, hey, I was just trying to buy her some tampons, you know, <laughs> but no, he didn't do that. It's like, <laughs> listen, King Charles, if you need a new PR person and if you want to talk to Camilla Parker Bowles on the phone and uh, you want to tell her that you want to be um, some really questionable things for her, I can fix it for you. I can fix it for you. I can fix whatever it is for you. <laughs> I'm saying they were phone repairmen. <laughs> oh, fucking him. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, that that's um that was quite something, isn't it? Wasn't it? <laughs> I can't. It's like it's been so long and I still can't get over it. It's just like it's just, I just, no one will, he's never going to live that down. He's literally never going to live that down. It's like the, it's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Like not craziest, but just like no one, no one should ever say that to a woman. It's not cute. It's not sexy. It's not like, it's not cute. It's not sexy. It's not, it, it, 
it's not loving. It's just don't ever say that to a woman. <laughs> Genuinely, I feel like if someone, if someone were to call me and quite literally be like, I want to be your tampon. <laughs> that would be it. Like, if my husband called me and told me he wanted to be my tampon, we would be divorced tomorrow. <laughs> we would be divorced tomorrow. There'd be no questions asked. And I quite literally mean it. I would think there is something very, very wrong with him. <laughs> that is a major red flag. <laughs> that is a major red flag. <laughs> oh my God. And also, thank you, Chloe. I really appreciate it. But so, yeah, if you guys have any more, if you guys have any questions or you want me to, like, it, or if you find it interesting, I don't know if I did a good job on this one because I was just kind of, like, scrambling to figure out what would be the best, like, bits of info to fit into it without making it seven hours long. Mm. Oh, uh, she is in UK. She's in Scotland. She's in Balmoral. She died in Balmoral. So if you mean like to England, then there are certain procedures and traditions and stuff like that that will prevent her body from getting there uh, until nine days later. Uh, but yeah, but if you guys want me to... But if you guys want me to do some more... Uh, some more reports on, uh, not reports, but some more like history facts about different figures. I saw somebody wanting to learn more about Prince Andrew. I mean, but as I said, like history, not gossip. History confirmed, also like confirmed facts, not gossip. And unfortunately, a lot of the things that we would want to hear about Prince Andrew are rumors. So, uh, and while I wholeheartedly believe that he's a crazy pedophile, <laughs> I, I can't, I really can't, <laughs> I really can't report on that. And, um, and I, uh, I, I can do some, I can try, I will, tr I'll try my best to find some interesting information. Uh, <laughs> history. Uh, yeah, I'll try my best to find some more information. But in the meanwhile, if there are figures from the royal family, because actually this is one of the topics that interested me very, very much. And I, di I do know like a lot about way too much about Lord Mountbatten and about Queen Elizabeth and about Prince F uh, and about Prince Philip and about all of them, really all of them. I know more about them than I than I should know, <laughs> to be honest. So if you, uh, Princess Margaret, uh, all of her like husbands, lovers, whatever. So if you want to hear more about uh, them or more about any royal family member, uh, please submit it into my Q and A on my page so I know which one, and I'll just respond to it with a with a video. I will be still prioritizing uh, information about Ukraine, obviously, but I will talk about. Um, but I will talk, I will release a video today talking a little bit about uh, Queen Elizabeth and King Charles. <laughs> and I will kind of give a shortened version of facts about them because, uh, well, a video is just going to be seen by more people. And I think it's important to pay tribute. And I think it's important to kind of, um, you know, mention some uh, things that uh, the the new king is very well known for, like, you know, the tampon story <laughs> and his whale's speech. But it's just the tampon story. He's never going to live that down. He's just never going to live that down. I mean, he should never have said that. And honestly, he shouldn't live that down because who says that? Who says that, honestly? <laughs> like, genuinely, even if he was the nicest person on the planet and he said that he wanted to be someone's tampon, I would still be like, uh, no one should ever forget that and no one should ever let him live that down no one especially the woman he said that to <laughs> oh that's so cool tammy that actually is really cool wait how the dna tests tell you that but yeah so okay Oh, hi, bartender. You changed your profile picture. Um, but so, okay, I am going to end this and I am going to go to uh, Box of Charles. I'm going to... 
I am going to go to, oh my gosh, not sleep. No, not sleep too early. I need to, I need to record another vid. I need to record a couple of videos. Okay. Important videos. I did not, I did not post a single video today and there are some news that came out today. So I'm going to go do that and then I'm going to go to sleep. And also the more, uh, the more you, my lovely moderators tell me what I should be doing, the less is the chance of me not doing it because here's the thing. <laughs> I really don't like being told what to do. It's that Cossack spirit in me, you know, and the more attention you pay to my sleep schedule, um, the more attention you pay to my sleep schedule, the le the less likely it is that I will adhere to it. And also, my normal bedtime is one thirty. And uh, again, <laughs> I really don't appreciate this uh, parental control over here. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, guys, I'm going to go. I'm not keeping Cinny up. Cinny is passed out. I'm not keeping my dog up. My dog up is literally, my dog is literally passed out somewhere. Oh my gosh. Okay, now my camera again. It's quite annoying. Okay, so I don't know what's happening on my camera today, but it's glitching. So um, I will uh, see you guys tomorrow and thank you for watching and i hope that i did a decent job so if you are from the uk and um you want to re-watch this and tell me whether i did well i will really appreciate it because i don't want to butcher your history but as far as i know i do know quite a bit about uh the history of the royal family and I did compile a whole like note section while I was doing this. And I think I was pretty impartial on everything but Charles. But come on, you can't be, you can't be impartial on Charles. The man wants to be someone's tampon. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>